Thank you. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you, Jeff Sheehy. You were speaking about the patients, and uh, I think it's safe to say that Jeff has done an, a heroic job, tireless efforts for, for HIV. I also want to thank CIRM for, uh, for not only supporting our project, but, uh, but supporting the space. You're going to see today that we've come a long way in HIV gene medicine, gene therapy. Uh, I also want to, uh, to just say that we want to thank the citizens of California. We consider ourselves uh, responsible stewards of their, of their money and, and recognize that this is a, a very important time. It's also a very important project. So as you can see, our company is really focused on HIV, uh, specifically gene therapy. And in fact, our project is really geared around that. In order to really understand where we are today, it's really important, I think, to take a step back, look at the global format, look at how the disease has progressed. Uh, HIV is, is a massive pandemic. And, and unfortunately, when you look at data, it doesn't necessarily share with you all the, the horrific stories of the patients themselves, but it does give you a bit of, of a landscape of where things are today. So if you look at uh, the, the numbers that are very well known, the 34 million patients, um, here in the United States we're at 1.2 million. Those are, again, fairly well-known numbers. But if you get to the less well-known numbers, you begin to see the difficulty with treating HIV. And that is, if you look at the patients well-controlled and adherent on therapy, it's only a little more than 10% of the overall population that have HIV. That's a pretty scary number, especially due to the fact that the world efforts have been spent on not just diagnosis, but also in increasing the amount of therapy worldwide. So in order to really understand this, you have to overlay it with the landscape over the course of the last decade. So if you look at the patients that are living with AIDS, it's increased. That is good news. Antiretroviral therapy has been doing a, a very good job of allowing patients to live with HIV versus die of AIDS. Um, the diagnostics have gone well in different regions of the world, and they're becoming more available. So uh, patients, uh, there are more patients, almost double what it was a decade ago. But if you look at the bottom, the newly infected per year we're still at about 2.5 million. And a lot of those are children. And if you split it in half, it's almost 50-50 between women and men that are, attracting, that are contracting HIV. So there's further complication. Despite the fact that these medications have been incredibly useful, and I'm sure that you have seen some of the spotlights in the past that really went into some of the complications of the antiretroviral therapy. The good news is people are able to be on it for long periods of time, but the bad news is, is that it unfortunately has an effect on different parts of their system. Their bones, sometimes their heart, there's an accelerated aging, um, and it's not a cure. And they have found that if you take patients off of antiretroviral therapy, there were studies that were done that were uh, uh, historical studies relevant to uh, tracking patients that have gone on some level of holiday, you'll see that their HIV comes back um, and their viral loads will retract within a, 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 four, uh, a fairly uh, short period of time. So the other issue is, is that you have low patient adherence rate, even here in the United States. And, and the news was not great. It came out uh, even at the last international uh, AIDS forum where people were talking about uh, just how difficult it is to have people continue to stay on antiretroviral therapy. Sometimes it's, it's adverse events. Sometimes it's treatment fatigue. Um, but here in the US, it's difficult. If you look at the rest of the world, the number is actually worse. So no therapy provides long-term immunity. And if you look on the right-hand side of this screen, 32 billion is really being spent on that 10% of the population with HIV. 
It's a pretty significant number. So alternatives are really desperately needed. So b back in the late 80s, David Baltimore had an idea. You know, it had been that gene medicine was going to be the future where you ended up working on defective genes, replacing them and the like. But, but he had the idea of something called intracellular immunization, where you'd be able to take a stem cell, treat it with something that would ultimately protect the cell itself. So instead of targeting the disease, you'd be targeting at boosting the immune system, a real significant uh, movement towards a different approach, not just to HIV, but potentially other diseases as well. The issue with this, though, is that this concept that David had was still at the early stages of the progression of this science. And so the field of gene therapy was still quite raw. Since that time period, there's been a lot of different advances uh, in technology that have really allowed for the field, the entire field, to, to grow and develop. If you look at those, it's really required that there are multi disciplinary advances for breakthroughs in any field to grow, in our field especially. So cell isolation techniques have advanced both for T cells and stem cells. The vector systems that you're all familiar with, that, that uh, you've been seeing different types of delivery mechanisms to get the payload of, of what you're looking to treat the disease with, have improved. In our particular case, we're working with a third generation system that has safety parameters. Understanding HIV and, and, and the concept of reservoirs and, and where HIV resides in the system and where it hangs out, that has also advanced. There are more uh, individual scientists that are working on that field. The other unique thing is that a number of different products, there were specifically two, but there are some in development, started looking at inhibiting HIV from the entry so if you could block HIV from getting into the system, and you'll see why this is so critical, that maybe you have an opportunity to decrease how it proliferates, how it grows, the increase of the viral load. Also, it's important to understand that there are different forms of HIV. It's not just a single tropic form. Even though CCR5, which is part of our particular story uh, we believe is one of the most critical elements. There's CXCR4 and people are starting to learn more about what that process looks like, entropic conversion and the like, and of course stem cell science. Just how many people are actually doing trials nowadays. It's over 2,500 trials for stem cell research that are in all phases of clinical trials. So. HIV gene therapy has been around for a while, and as I had mentioned, it's still a work in progress. We feel, uh, I mean truly, we, we are the culmination of decades of work, certainly for our founding members, David Baltimore, Irvin Chen, Inder Verma, the ones that have been in this space, uh, along with Dr. Simons, who will have a chance to speak here. They, they've spent a career really working on refinement, understanding what the data was sharing so that you could move forward and take the next step into a clinical trial that had a better opportunity for optimization of really battling the disease. So there have been over 220 patients that have been treated with HIV gene therapy over the course of the last 20 years. If you really look at what has been achieved and what's been learned is we know that the stem cells and T cells actually can be successfully harvested, gene modified, and given back. Uh, marking level, unfortunately, without any type of conditioning, is about 0.001% or 0.38%. What this means is you want to get those stem cells to go back into the bone and continue to repopulate with new T cells that ultimately become the warrior cells of the body to fight HIV. If you can't get enough of those cells in, there may not be enough selective pressure by HIV, which kills off the other cells, in order to have that be the therapy, the one-time therapy, versus having to do this multiple times. So we are hopeful, and you'll see why, that we can begin to move forward in increasing that number. We also have learned that monotherapy is likely not sufficient to really prevent resistance. Just like the cocktail therapy, HIV, 
finds new ways of going around different therapeutic mechanisms. And so you really need to make sure that you have a multi-dimensional, multi-therapeutic approach. There are encouraging results about viral load and CD4 T cell counts. Sangamo has just recently uh, published some data as well as Carl June. It's very exciting. There's also selective advantage that has been demonstrated back in 2005 through Padzikoff's work. And it's been shown over at City of Hope, uh, they are working primarily with HIV uh, uh, leukemia patients or lymphoma patients that, um, that myeloablation increases the level of engraftment. So there are hints along the way. And, and really, part of this process has been to learn what is going to work to be able to tweak it, manage it, and come at it with a new mechanism. So the Cal-1 therapy that we're taking forward that, uh, that CIRM is helping to support really has multiple uh, different uh, places that we have looked to impact uh, trying to head towards better efficacy uh, for HIV gene medicine. The first is that we've got a combination therapy. Uh, and we have found, at least in the early mouse and uh, uh, animal studies that we have conducted, including simian studies, that were active against all tropic forms. Now, again, my studies, simian studies, are not human beings. So it's an important next step. But it's good indicators that we're on the right track. Also, it's mitigated against resistance meaning that it continues to work even though there's different generations of the form of HIV. We're also looking to target two different cell types. We're looking at targeting the T cells, the cells that are actually uh, directly attacked by HIV to strengthen them, and those tend to be shorter lived, though there are some of those types of cells that live longer in the system, and there have been different groups that have shown that. But we're also going to be treating the hematopoietic stem cells, which are the CD4, CD34 positive stem cells, for long-term protection. And the idea there is, if you can actually protect those cells, the ones that are producing the T cells, you would have protection potentially for a much longer time period, potentially indefinitely for a patient. Again, this is the concept. Uh, we are now looking to, to, to put this into our very first safety trial. And then, of course, engineering resistance. What we're looking to have happen here is that there would be selective uh, expansion of the cells that we modify, uh, that we put in, where HIV, again, is that selective pressure. And then lastly, we're planning on using a level of conditioning, which allows for space of these stem cells so that when the stem cells are reintroduced into the body, that they home to the the marrow and continue to produce the T cells that are so important for protecting against this particular uh, uh, nasty disease. So the two active inhibitors that we are using, and you're probably very familiar with CCR5, which is a co-receptor on the surface of T cells that is used by HIV to get into the cell uh, and wreak havoc. Um, so we have something that decreases that co-receptor, and then we also have something that blocks the fusion. So if, if somehow HIV can attach, even if it can attach, we have a secondary mechanism called C46 that would block it from fusing to allow for the viral envelope ultimately to get in. We've consistently, again, in our preclinical models, seen a three and a half to four log inhibition. Um, this is, is quite good against what uh, tends to be the case with antiretroviral uh, medication. Um, and if you look at uh, the, the test that we've conducted, we wanted to make sure that, again, resistance was something that we could tackle. So we've tested it against CCR5, CXCR4, and dual tropic strains of virus, and it has, it has done well uh, in those areas as well. So why did we select this particular mechanism? Why is it so important to hone in on a mechanism like a co-receptor? Well, nature has done a lot of wonders for HIV. Um, and for some patients, nature has actually provided a specific level of protection, complete protection, if they don't have um, this particular gene that creates the co-receptor. So 1% of Caucasians actually lack CCR5, and they're completely protected. 
whereas about 10% have about half of the CCR5. They do get HIV, but they have a delay of the progression of disease by three to five years. So again, half of this CCR5 provides a delay. What, what Dr. Baltimore and scientists at Calimune have looked to do is decrease that number from a half to much, much lower percent. So in our, our previous studies, we've been able to get approximately a tenfold decrease in CCR5, which has translated to protection of those cells. So up until about 2006, people that had been looking at cell and gene therapy for HIV were incredibly skeptical whether it was even feasible to consider this path. And if you look at um, that time period, you can see that people were getting a bit more traction in regards to antiretroviral therapy, though the costs were continuing to go up. And they were hopeful uh, that the generics, when generics came uh, out, that that they would be able to, to provide that to the rest of the world at a, a low enough cost and get that out. Unfortunately, you know, that effort, as you can see, it's, it's been very, very good. The progress has been good, but it has not really captured all of the patients. And, um, and so in 2006, there was something that provided tremendous hope for the entire community. And that was that a doctor ended up treating an HIV leukemia patient um, Timothy Ray Brown, who you see on the left-hand side of the screen, uh, the doctor Giro Hooter on the right. Uh, the patient had HIV and leukemia, required a full bone marrow transplant. And because of that, he needed to have cells from a different patient. His doctor deciding that, um, that he might be able to do an experiment where he would provide uh, blood type matched uh, cells back to his, his patient, but also with that rare CCR5 negative uh, uh, constituency, when he ended up giving those cells back, he recognized that his patient uh, had no HIV detectable, and it's now six years later, and uh, the patient has no HIV and leukemia. And, um, and this was a big step forward, because despite the fact that it was somebody else's cells, despite the fact that it was an allogeneic transplant, it ended up having a result that showed that HIV in this particular circumstance, and it was just one patient, could potentially be uh, eradicated. They call it a functional cure, and I say potentially because HIV still may be there, but this patient has been off of all antiretroviral therapy for that time period. So it's very exciting, and Back in 2006, this was at the cutting edge. Today, many are looking to repeat this exact experiment. But we're not looking to do this exact experiment because giving somebody, somebody else's cells could be extremely difficult to scale this to the, the type of, of world population that we're talking about. So in order to really talk about exactly what we're doing, that hopefully begins to take a path of moving towards what transpired with the Berlin patient is Dr. Jeff Simons. Jeff.